uh, was published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives in 1993. So at first glance, uh, Keynes and Ronald have nothing in common, except they're both great English economists who love the ballet and who attacked Pigou. Pigou is a colleague of Keynes's at Cambridge. In fact, Pigou was the professor of economics, and Keynes was just a fellow. They attacked different parts of Pigou. Keynes attacked Pigou's theory of unemployment, and Ronald attacked his theory of externalities. So this, so far, is not much to build a comparison on. And of course, there are a lot of ways in which they differ. Keynes was a liberal. Coase, of course, is conservative. Keynes was a macroeconomist. Uh, Coase is a microeconomist. Keynes was upper class. I mean, nothing, <laughs> no offense intended. A celebrity, a great public figure, a baron. A man of the world, a speculator. In his youth, a homosexual, what we who study such things call an opportunistic homosexual. He was a brilliant writer on diverse subjects, of course. He was a bestseller. He was Eaton, Cambridge, the Apostles, Bloomsbury, the establishment, the intellectual and governing elite of England. And Ronald is none of these things. And he's also an expatriate, almost an American. And Keynes didn't much like Americans. But these differences are superficial from the standpoint of uh, their approaches to economics, because they, they share an approach that was once dominant, that fell into disfavor, but that's undergoing a revival as a result of the worldwide financial crash of September 2008, which took the economics profession by surprise and has created profound doubts about the profession's understanding of the economy. It was shortly after the crash that I read for the first time a Keynes's masterpiece, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, um, published in 1936. I found Keynes's approach um, unfamiliar but convincing. And it did put me in mind of my paper on uh, Ronald's methodology, and I, I went back and I reread it. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, what I said descriptively about Ronald's methodology in that article, I think is correct, especially since it was mainly just quoting from Ronald. I summarized it by saying that Ronald had declared war on modern economics. And in support of that, I quoted statements such as, when economists find that they are unable to um, analyze what is happening in the real world, they invent an imaginary world which they are capable of handling. Um, he wrote that the rational model, which is central to modern economics, is this is all quotations from Ronald's, is unnecessary and misleading because, in his words, there's no reason to suppose that most human beings are engaged in maximizing anything unless it be unhappiness, and even this with incomplete success. <laughs> uh, he wants economists to study man as he is. He wants to abandon the assumption that an individual's choices are consistent. He does not regard equilibrium, seem not to regard equilibrium as a useful concept in economics. And he's skeptical not only about, um, about abstraction and uh, the formalization of economic theory, one of the reasons he doesn't like the term Coase theorem, which belongs to you know, a, a for, 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 formal uh, a theory. Theorems belong to formal theory, obviously. He's also skeptical about empirical methods, the empirical methods, the heavily statistical empirical methods that modern economists uh, employ. He rejects the influential methodological principle of Milton Friedman that a theory should be tested not by the realism of, of its assumptions, but by the accuracy of its predictions. He prefers the case study to uh, the study of statistical data as a way of doing empirical economics. I said in my article, I think this is correct, that there are two basic conceptions of economics as a field. And the older one conceived of economics as the study of the economic system with whatever tools uh, are at hand. The newer approach to economics conceives of it as the application of the model 
of rational choice to any domain of human behavior in which the use of the model might be fruitful. It's not limited to the economic system in the conventional sense of uh, trade. Ronald is, is an adherent to the older conception of economics. And he's gone so far as to say, that is to write, so I'll have them you know, all nailed down in prose, that there's been very little progress in economics since Adam Smith. And in fact, there may have been regress. There are two further um, uh, small points that bear on the relation between uh, Ronald and Keynes. Um, one is that when Ronald in his Nobel Prize talk said that his work will one day, he thought his work will one day bring about a complete change in the structure of economic theory, he added, at least in what is called price theory or microeconomics. But in fact, the, the utility of the approach that he shares with Keynes, I think, is even greater in macroeconomics than in micro. This, the second, a second little uh, curiosity is that um, Ronald has claimed to, to not, not to have been significantly influenced by any American economist other than Frank Knight. And Knight is the economist who agreed with Keynes on a, on a critical point in the general theory, which I'm going to mention. So the general theory, the masterpiece, in 1992, Greg Mankiw, who then as now is a prominent macroeconomist at Harvard, wrote that, quote, after 50 years of additional progress in economic science, the general theory is an outdated book. We are in a much better position than Keynes was to figure out how the economy works. And in a moment, you'll see uh, Greg Mankiw eating those words. So the general theory is not outdated. What is true, it's, it's a hard read. <laughs> um, not, not because it's mathematical. It's not a mathematical book. There's some math, not, not a great deal. Um, it's, it's, what there is is high school algebra and a little bit of differential calculus. And although Keynes had started as a, as a, as a mathematician, written a book on probability theory, He's kind of apologetic about the math and the general theory. And he actually, at one point, says, hey, you can skip it. Instead of being a mathematical work, it's, it's a work of really elegant prose. I think that's somewhat off-putting to economists who are not you know, that, that interested in literary values, generally. You know, it's full of aphorisms, like, um, it is better that a man should tyrannize over his bank balance than over his fellow citizens. So it's full of that kind of thing. It's also full of you know, unfamiliar terms and digressions and afterthoughts and, and some really stray observations, uh, such as, I'm quoting, the two most delightful occupations open to those who do not have to earn their living are authorship and experimental farming. Well, that's, that's not the sort of thing you're going to read in Econometrica. In fact, general theory is especially difficult reading for present day academic economists because their conception of economics is so remote from Keynes's. That's what made the book seem outdated to Mankiw and that led uh, Bob Lucas, writing a few years after Mankiw, to characterize the general theory as an ideological event rather than a contribution to economic theory. And before that, in 1980, uh, Bob Lucas had notoriously written that um, when Keynesian economics is mentioned in an economics workshop, um, the people attending the workshop whisper and giggle. I don't think he'd say that today. So as I say, Keynes, like uh, Coase, adhered to this older view that economics is the study of the economic system and uh, you use whatever analytical or empirical methods you think apt, apt, apt to the particular subject you're looking at. There was a presumption, and I think this is true of Ronald's work, despite that crack about people trying to maximize unhappiness. There was a, a presumption, his work and Keynes's work, in this whole older field of economics, that business firms uh, do try to maximize profits. Individuals do try to maximize their utility. 
but how well they succeeded was left open. So Keynes wanted to be realistic about decision making rather than explore how far an economist can get by assuming that people base decisions on a close approximation to cost benefit analysis. And that's a perfectly good approach for economists to take. My point is only that it's not the only approach and that we, we sh ha should have renewed appreciation for the approach that Keynes takes and that I, I think uh, Ronald shares. So you find in the general theory uh, a number of psychological observations. In fact, the word psychological appears many times in the general theory, and it's said without apology. <laughs> Keynes says, hey, you know, I'm an economist, but I've got the psychological point I really think I have to make. I'm sorry, but no, he, he's very unselfconscious about what tools, what assumptions, what concepts he uses. And in fact, psychology is very important to his analysis. He says some things like, which is echoed today, he says, during a boom, the popular estimation of risk is apt to become unusually and imprudently low, which is what many people are saying today about the boom that preceded our current bust. And he says, which is also extremely pertinent, that during a bust, the, quote, animal spirits, it's a big uh, phrase in the general, it only appears once in the general theory, but it's been picked up a lot. He says the animal spirits of entrepreneurs droop. So he uses these insights without, um, without worrying about how they fit into a model of uh, rational decision making. Now this approach came very naturally to Keynes because he wasn't an academic economist in the modern uh, sense of, of the word. word. He didn't have a degree in economics. He wrote extensively in other fields. I mentioned that he started out as a mathematician. He wrote a book on probability theory that doesn't mention economics at all. He was an economics fellow at Cambridge, but he combined that with extensive government service, civil service, an important civil servant, high-level government advisor, speculator, polemicist, a journalist, extremely eclectic and extremely involved in the economic, financial, and political life of uh, England. And another striking feature of the, of the general theory, it's not empirical. It's not theoretical in a kind of formal mathematical sense. It's also not empirical. There are a few tables of statistics, but there's no analytic statistics uh, in the book. Um, now, of course, now Keynes, unlike Ronald, didn't do case studies, but he didn't have to do case studies. He was sort of a case study of himself because he was involved in government, was involved in business, uh, systematized. Now, but there is, there is now, a, a, I think, an important difference. Uh, Ronald's, um, Ronald, I think, could have, if he'd wanted to, he could have written his, his papers in the idiom of modern economics, uh, because his analyst, despite what, uh, ha ha what Harold said this morning, the basic um, approach is, is classical economics. And cer certain parts of it are not congenial to, to Ronald, but it's, you know, it's recognizably classical economic uh, analysis. But, uh, Concepts that are central to the general theory uh, don't, I think, fit uh, formal models in economics very well. Um, of course, you're dealing with, in uh, macroeconomics, business cycle economics, so on. You're, you're dealing with, you know, vast uh, uh, economy-wide phenomena and the interrelations of money and interest rates and employment and all sorts of things. It's, it's actually too it seems to be too complicated to model. Um, and it seems to be one of the ways that, one of the reasons that the macroeconomists and the finance theorists um, were, with only a few exceptions, um, failed to anticipate the financial crisis of uh, 2008 and um, the ensuing, you know, deep downturn in the economy. And so in the wake of this a real disappointment for the economics profession, we, we, we have Greg Mankiw now writing contritely, if you were going to turn to only one economist to understand the problems facing the economy, there's little doubt that the economist would be John Maynard Keynes. 
Although Keynes died more than a half century ago, his diagnosis of recessions and depressions remains the foundation of modern macroeconomics. His insights go a long way toward explaining the challenges we now confront. That's a kind of remarkable statement. And Greg Mankiw, by the way, is a conservative macroeconomist. He's not a, a lefty. But it seems that it turns out that Keynes' you know, informal, unrigorous, unmathematized analysis of the macroeconomy seems to have provided greater insight into our current economic situation than 75 years of increasingly formal, rigor rigorous, mathematized analysis. I mean, when you have the leading economic student of the Great Depression, that's Ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, blindsided by a repetition of the circumstances that led to the Great Depression, credit binge over leveraged banks, new era thinking, and who then responds with a sort of conventional monetary policy response that does, uh, of you know, just reducing the federal funds rate and it doesn't work, um, then you begin to suspect that the uh, uh, disappointing performance of the economics profession in regard to the current crisis is due to forgetfulness of Keynes. I want to say something about this link between Knight and Keynes, because I think it's, it's very important to understanding um, the Keynesian methodology. Um, so you have to start off with, I'll call this the separation thesis. So something very much emphasized in Keynes is that is the distinction between the people who save money and by saving provide money for investment in projects, and the people who do the projects, the entrepreneurs, the firms. They're different people. And um, you can have a situation which people decide to save, and you know, hoard, they hoard. They're afraid to spend money. Uh, so they're just, they're just saving. They're sitting on it. And uh, this could limit investment funds. And then on the other side, you have a situation where, well, maybe the savers would like to invest and so on. But the people actually have to decide on a project. Are they going to build a factory, which isn't going to yield uh, any revenue for two or three years? Uh, should they do that? Um, what Keynes said, using the concept of uncertainty that he and Knight had independently discovered, he said, there's a big difference between two types of risk. One is a calculable risk, and he illustrated with roulette. If you're not worried about the casino cheating, you know exactly what the probability is of you know, hitting red, if you're betting on red on a roulette wheel. But if you're, the question you ask yourself is, how likely is it that you're going to be divorced um, when you get married, you decide whether to get married, you say, well, what's the probability of my being divorced? You can't figure that out. There are divorce statistics. But you can't apply them on the individual level. So that's uncertainty. So the puzzle for Keynes was, what is it that makes people engage in uncertain behavior, in particular in the case of businessmen? Because um, very often, the, the decision the businessman has to make, whether to invest, build a, have a project, new design, buy a firm, expand, subtract, what have you, expand, contract, um, is, it's a decision made under uh, profound uncertainty. You can try to hedge, insure to a certain extent, but not, not completely. And, and so the other question arises, well, is it, a, is it rational for a person to make an investment when his estimate of the expected net benefits is little more than a guess, because he can't assign a probability to the success of the enterprise, maybe uncertain about costs and all sorts of things. And I think this is a question that, that is uncomfortable for a modern economists, because how do you do a cost-benefit analysis if you don't know the probability uh, of the benefits and the costs? And so Keynes' response to this is not to worry about what's rational and what's irrational, because I say his analysis doesn't depend on any very definite assumptions about human behavior. He simply had observed businessmen taking non-calculable risks. And he observed if there, were, if there weren't any people willing to do that, people who had what he called an urge to action, a capitalist economy simply wouldn't function. So business is a field of activity. It attracts bold people, 
The timid people they become civil servants or professors, you know. Um, and, and, you know, the, the bold engage in the entrepreneur. And they're people who just have greater tolerance for uncertainty, less tolerance, less uncertainty, aversion. Um, and um, so, th so then you, and the, the next point is that this emotion, these animal spirits, the boldness that will cause business people to make uh, investments under a certain, this is um, a kind of a fragile uh, psychological asset you have, this willingness to take risks, your animal spirits. And they can, they can dim very suddenly in a situation of, of, of economic distress. I mean, you can take only so much uncertainty. So, um, and, and, then, and that's how you get into the, uh, a bust situation, a depression, serious or a serious recession. So what happened in our current situation was that um, there's a, a tremendous drop in household wealth because of the bursting of the housing bubble. So when, there's, when people's wealth de declines, they, they change their behavior. They save more. They change their pattern of consumption expenditures. And now, at the other side, the businessmen seeing this change in consumer behavior and uncertainties mounting up as they wonder about how government is going to respond and so on, they begin to, to freeze. Their animal spirits uh, dim. And you resolve, of course, you can get yourself into a, into a, a downward cycle. People save, save money, so maybe they spend less or spend on different things. Um, producers produce less, um, so they employ less. Now their people have lower incomes and greater anxieties, and that affects their consumption. Get yourself into a downward spiral. Now, this is simply an example of how in certain situations where the formalisms of modern economics just have great difficulty dealing with issues um, because they, don't, they just don't fit the, the type of formal uh, thinking that economists do. Here's an example of an informal type of economics um, done by Keynes can yield these uh, imp very important insights. Um, and this, I think, is also characteristic of Ronald's um, economics. But now I have a question for Ronald. So Keynes, of course, was a, a liberal, a lefty by our standards today. And that liberalism was, was perfectly uh, in tune with his approach to economics. He didn't consider markets to be self-regulated, re regulating. Um, he thought, this is not something I mentioned, but this is actually big emphasis in the general theory. He actually thought involuntary unemployment could be an equilibrium, to be stuck there. He thought, uh, he advocated extensive government intervention to keep the economy from running off the rails. There's, there's actually a utopian streak in the general theory. I'm sure quite repulsive to everybody in this room. <laughs> Because he predicted that within a century, people's material wants would be satiated. And when that happened, the demand for capital would plummet. And rentier, you know, people who just live on investment income, they would be wiped out, which he wanted. He, he, that prospect delighted uh, Keynes. And he looked forward to, uh, in his words, the euthanasia of the rentier. Didn't mean it literally. But, um, but as I say, his, his economics and his politics uh, were in phase. But now, Ronald's extreme hostility to government regulation, of which we've heard a lot uh, today and yesterday, um, uh, I don't think it sorts so well with his skepticism about, about um, uh, rational choice economics. You know, there's a passage in The Problem of Social Cost where he suggests that sort of all pollution is, 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 uh, is due to the, the government. Um, but, I mean, think about it. If, if he's right and people are busy maximizing their unhappiness and markets are never in equilibrium, you'd think that would mean there was a lot of work 
left for the government to do. Not that it would do it well, but if you have these profound uh, market failures, you, you would at least want to explore with some care <laughs> the potentiality for uh, the government. In particular, given his theory of social costs, in which transaction costs can prevent contractual solutions to externalities, you think there'd be some sympathy for government regulation of uh, pollution. And also, uh, Ronald's hostility to government regulation, it doesn't seem to have the analytical basis or theoretical basis that you can find in Hayek and other members of the Austrian School of Economics, or you can find in, in Mansur Olson or George Stigler or the other you know, public choice um, uh, people. It seems Ronald's hostility to government to, to be entirely empirical. You know, he studied the British Post Office and the Federal Communications Commission, the private ownership of lighthouses, and in all these and other economic settings that he studied, he's found either that regulation does badly, or that, as in the lighthouse example, the private market does well despite circumstances that theory suggests should prevent the market from working. But presumably, he picks his case studies with an eye to probable government failure um, and surprise successes of the private market where you might expect a government failure. Um, he doesn't seem to be interested in studying the government successes, of which there must be some since we're still, you know, surviving under our government. Um, so the firmness of his conclusions about, about government failure doesn't appear to be based on a theory of government, but instead appears to reflect the confidence with which he rejects formal theory and formal empirical methods in favor of a, his adherence to a tradition, which I consider an illustrious tradition, and we could call it common sense economics, and I think it's the, the economics of Adam Smith, of John Maynard Keynes, and of Ronald Coase. They're all economic geniuses, and our current economic troubles have invited uh, renewed respect. Uh, you, your paper talks about the mathematization of um, economics, and one sort of sees in there perhaps some agreement with the notion that the common sense approach may be superior in some ways, at least in terms of uh, utility. And what I was wondering about is when we think about one economics and, and where one economics is going, we have to, as, as more lawyers uh, are formally trained in PhDs, we have seen a growing um, technical nature of the work, as well as we're now seeing a boom of econometric work being done in law and economics. And uh, my question is, how do you evaluate that in terms of its utility for, a, in terms of legal change, in terms of legal thinking about law? And uh, is it something that is supplanting the former common sense approach in terms of standards in, in the university? And do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and if it's a bad thing, uh, has, is there any way of turning back on that? No, I think that's, I think that's fine, and I think statistical analysis is, is tremendously valuable. And so an example this morning was, um, uh, was Bill Landis' talk about citations. But, the, but a, a, an example from, also from this morning was Michael Levine's uh, a paper about, about, airline, about the airline industry, because obviously, Michael Levine is bringing something different to the to the table, which is his immersion in the in the um, uh, airline industry, not just as a scholar, but of course as a as an official of three airlines, spent a number of years in the airline industry. And I think that's extremely valuable, and that we don't want to lose sight of alternatives to the mathematical approach. So Bob Lucas, who I, I like uh, beating up on occasionally, he, he's written that the only thing that's happened since Adam Smith is a greater formalization of economics, that 
progress in economics means progress in mathematical modeling and uh, of, of progress in economic theory means progress in mathematization. I, I think that's, that's an exaggeration. I, and I think what we found with regard to business cycle economics is that the mathematization has not been useful because the business cycle is too complicated to be, to be modeled. And we've also found that one of the reasons that the economics profession was so surprised by what happened in 2008 is that very few macroeconomists have any real institutional knowledge. They didn't know a lot about modern banking and its fragilities. And because it's very complicated, you have to really immerse yourself in detail. And those institutional details are very difficult, if, if, if at all, maybe impossible, to um, accommodate in a, in, a for, in a formal theory. And particularly for economics in a law school, um, considering who the students are and the background of the law professors, um, that ought to be not just the, the economists in the law school should not just constitute an economics department that happens to find itself in a law school and studies economic problems that relate to law. It ought also to be something distinctive which brings in knowledge and reasoning methods and of, of, of law so that you have something besides conventional, modern, formal economics uh, being sort of accidentally conducted in a, in a law school. Uh, uh, I have a couple of points to make. I don't really see the connection between Coase and Keynes, to tell you the truth. If you look at the three most widely cited articles of Coase, and I'm taking this from Bill Landis, something like 80 to 90 percent of his citations, they're not on Mainly, they don't refer to the points that you mentioned in, in your talk. There are three papers, the theory of the firm, problem of social costs, and the durable goods problem. Now, in all three of these papers, he basically uses neoclassical type reasoning. In fact, the durable goods problem is a very sophisticated example of that reasoning, and therefore has mainly attracted the attention of, th of theorists, game theorists, and other theorists. Those have been the main people who have been interested in it, but it's been very highly cited. It's a very insightful paper on what happens to competition over time. You know, theory of the firm says, look, it's more efficient to have things within a firm than outside the firm. You're doing it within the firm. I mean, it maybe doesn't write an equation down. Uh, the, the theory of social costs would say, well, look, you have this reciprocal thing, you try to bargain into an efficient solution. If you can't, you try to work out some, some uh, uh, as best you can. Um, and I don't see that outside of the neoclassical tradition. I, I, I've always thought it's a false dichotomy between mathematical formulations and non-mathematical formulations. I had a teacher, I'm sure Ron will respect so lot, Jacob Viner. Now, Jacob Viner hardly ever used any mathematics. He was very ill-trained in mathematics. In fact, one of his most famous mistakes was because he didn't really understand the what's called the envelope theorem. But Jacob Viner was a very outstanding neoclassical economist and made important contributions to neoclassical economists. I think that's where Ronald's contributions have lied, uh, beside the over the dicta he may have said about people are rational. So he was using rational economists. Now, if you look at Keynes, Keynes is, is a very mixed picture. In much of his life, he was actually a liberal in the European sense, not an interventionist. He became an interventionist more during the Great Depression. Um, his tract on monetary reform. It's a great use of, uh, of economics, uh, traditional economics, but really very insightful. Um, and I'm not a macroeconomist, but macroeconomists began to discard their confidence in Keynes really after two events. One, Keynesian at the time predicted a great depression after World War II. Larry Klein and other leading Keynesians. Um, it didn't happen. 
Yet the simple Keynesian model that they were all using at the time predicted that savings would grow as a fraction of income. Where you wouldn't be able to get the investment to finance it, and you'd go wrong. Secondly, they predicted this great trade-off between inflation and unemployment, and a lot of work said, at least at that time, that wasn't happening. You were getting inflation and high unemployment at the same time. So people abandoned it, or maybe they abandoned it uh, prematurely. But it wasn't only the mathematical economists who, who abandoned it. Uh, many economists either abandoned the simple Keynesian model or tried to merge the sort of rational expectations literature with some Keynesian, I think, real insights into sticky wages and, and issues of that type that had always been recognized in the economics literature but never really well treated. Um, now, maybe that literature is better than the dynamic, uh, you know, general equilibrium literature that is associated with Bob, uh, and maybe not. Uh, but let me add that I think financial crisis that we got into, you find more insights into Milton Friedman's work on monetary history and the role of monetary mischief than you find in Keynes. Well, if I could just respond briefly. That, bus the, that business of uh, uh, you, um, Phil, that Phillips curve stuff is not in Keynes. It's, it's Kane, what Keynes says in the general theory is if you have full employment and you try to increase demand, you just get inflation. The, beginning very shortly after Keynes, you know, with Hicks, uh, Keynesian economics became something very different from what is in the general theory. And of course, Keynes was dying in 1946, was not around to uh, ex express a view on that. Um, and just one thing, no, I, I agree with you about uh, um, Ronald's work is basically classical uh, uh, economics. Now, but you wouldn't want a situation in which you said, well, Ronald, because you haven't written this in mathematical form, we're not going to give you tenure. I just, I have trouble with this uh, public address system. Yeah, it's very hard. Well, I, find I think I heard what he was saying, so maybe I'll start yeah, out. Yeah. Um, well, Hayek was a great economist. No, I'm not, I'm not going to try to uh, argue against it. He was my teacher when he was at the University of Chicago, uh, in the, when he was in the Committee on Social Thought. Um, I don't really see the connection with Coase, to, to, to tell you the truth. Um, and, and I've always found Hayek's Prices and Production, which is his most famous book on business cycles, unreadable. Uh, maybe it's my own limitations, but I tried it five times, and I couldn't really figure out what he was saying, but um, maybe it was a great book. I, he did do great work, but his great work came later, in my judgment, in his uh, analysis of the role of prices and the information communicated by prices. There you might find some connection with Coase. But he did not himself or many of his followers believe he had to have a detailed institutional knowledge of the economy, study individual industries, and so on. Um, uh, he never did it himself, to my knowledge, and he never advocated it, um, and never have, as his followers advocated it. And this is what Ronald has advocated. Maybe it hasn't, you know, it has been followed to some extent by economists in the profession um, that you need. Uh, like I thought the paper today by Levine on the um, airline industry. Used to me, he used neoclassical economics, but neoclassical economics embedded in a very close knowledge of how that industry operated. 
And when I spoke to him in private afterwards about how why did the unions allow it, he had good answers, combining law and, and economic reasoning to explain why the unions, uh, and that was an important part of his story, was evolved. But if you look at the main emphasis in Coase, um, I don't, I don't really see the connection uh, with Hayek, except possibly his American Economic Review article on the role of prices in conveying information and why central planning can't do it. Well, that's not an issue that Coase really ever addressed, to my knowledge. Richard? Yeah. I'm perfectly happy to listen. <laughs> <laughs> about what our constitution, our constitution means, or what constitution you want to write. Private property shall not be taken without justice. Well, okay, but that, yeah, we've been around that. No, but I mean, if you listen to the discussion this morning, you were talking about the right to disposition being the essential part of property. Disposition is what sets up voluntary transactions. Protect the property, protect the voluntary transactions, because the whole genius of the system of private property is within its own domain. It gives you a complete definition of allocation of all resources. I think the theory is substantively interesting and useful, but attributing it to the Constitution, I think, is erroneous. I mean, I don't think in adopting the Taken Clause, the framers had Epstein in mind. Um, and I don't think they had it even remotely in mind. And they may also not have had in mind new dancing. But the leap is a lot less than it is with respect to what they had in mind and the kind of economic system that you would like to put in place. Privileges and immunities, classic illustration of a preference for competition over monopoly. And that I think is a lot of what the monopoly was about. And what the objections to the bad reading of the takings clause that you defend is about. We've played monopolistic institutions take over politically. And I think that was a serious fear you just associated with faction, which is obviously a very dominant concern with them. Yes. I'd like the panel to see if you can apply uh, the Coase theorem to the financial crisis, which I think has been raised by Judge Posner. And that is the basic thesis, of course, as I understand it, is that uh, private cost and social cost are going to be equalized unless you have a defective institutional framework. Now, isn't that exactly what happened in the financial crisis? In other words, I mean, Judge Roger, you, you made the claim that you hear a lot in the media that this was market failure. And in fact, the title of your book, uh, you know, A Failure of Capitalism. Uh, and then at the end of your book, of course, you completely reverse yourself and you talk about government failure at the end of your book. And lots of studies have come out now, the Wall Street Journal, I mean, book after book to show that there was a defective institutional problem in the United States in housing, how we excessively encourage this uh, real estate boom and so forth. So given all those studies that have come out, how can you still say this was a failure, a market failure of capital, a failure of capitalism? I'm sure you would. So let me explain the title. So capitalism, is a uh, is is a is a system. It's not it's not it's not um, synonymous with free markets. 
and we've heard a lot about it. You need property rights. No, no, wait a second, let me finish, let me finish. So capitalism is a system and its parts include not only the markets, but include a government that enforces property rights and contracts and so on, and it includes a central bank. Now some people think you don't need a central bank, you have free banking, but uh, most economists believe that in a, for modern economy, it needs a central bank. What I argue in the book is that the, uh, the, 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 the main cause of the problem was incompetent uh, regulation by the Federal Reserve, both regulation of the, mon of the money supply, interest rates, and regulation of banking. So that's that, what I think basic. Where, the, where there is an externality and therefore a market failure has to do with the fact that if you're in finance, um, you will be concerned about, and you're deciding, you're a bank, you're deciding how much risk to take. You will be concerned about the cost to you of bankruptcy. But you will not be concerned about the cost to the entire economy if you and the rest of the banks, because you have common strategies, are all subject to the same risk and the risk happens to materialize and there's a crash. That's, and when you have an externality, there is at least a prima facie case for government intervention. And that's why we have bank regulation, it's why we have a central bank. And it seems to me those institutions of capitalism, which are, which are fundamental and very important, that's what failed. I, I don't blame the bankers at all. It seems to me the bankers took risks which they thought were reasonable given what they knew, uh, but they were not going to be super cautious because of possible macroeconomic risk or systemic risk, as it's called, because you don't expect a profit-maximizing firm to worry about costs that its conduct will impose on strangers to the firm. So I, I doubt that there's any disagreement between us. Well, no, I, I, I would disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think the way you describe it, Dick, is the failure of government. I mean, treating the Fed as an instrument of, of the government, which it basically is. Um, I would not write a book called the failure, uh, uh, the failure or a failure of capitalism. But I do believe that uh, many of the private sector markets perform poorly during this episode. I don't think they, um, for whatever reason, uh, in terms of, uh, and I don't think, and, and as I was talking to somebody at lunch, I think the consumers in some ways behaved a lot better than the lenders did. I mean, you got zero, or low, very low interest rates, very, almost no down payments. Of course it pays to buy a house. So they take away from you in two years. You, you, you own the house for two years with pretty low cost. And why people carried these assets is the problem uh, we have to understand better why they had such high multiples on their asset to capital ratios. And I think in retrospect they made mistakes. I mean they didn't maybe fully understand the systemic risk. And it's true, the Fed made mistakes. Um, both Greenspan and Bernanke, uh, they made mistakes, but um, I think the private sector made important uh, mistakes as well. So um, it, I would say one but in evaluating capitalism, the reason I wouldn't, I mean, yeah, various markets failed in this case. I, I do believe they did. Uh, but I'd like to evaluate the system not over a two-year period uh, where the economy was flat or declined for a couple of quarters, now it seems to be increasing, but over a 20-year period where the growth rate was very high, unemployment was very, was very low, inflation was low, um, and a lot of good things happened in, in both the U.S. and the world economy. This, to me, was a great success of, of markets. And in the fall of 2008, there was a fear that because of what looked like we are going to be in for a really severe crash, um, that we are going to overthrow, as the 30s did, overthrow a lot of the attributes of capitalism. 
At the time, I argued, I didn't think it would happen if, if we didn't get into anywhere near a Great Depression. It didn't happen. I don't think it is going to happen. You get a modification in markets, but you're not going to get an overthrow in high. I think for a simple reason that most of the world still recognizes that a capitalist, what I would call a capitalist system, a market system, has provided great benefits for its population. So you don't see, you don't see China, you don't see India, you don't see Brazil. But I think is the I think what uh, what I what I think Gary is leaving out. I think the political consequences of this crash are tremendous. That the government is far more deeply involved in business than it has been since the 30s, and there's no sign of that changing. I mean, you've got major corporations that are that are government owned now. Citigroup basically is owned by the government. General Motors is owned by the government. The government has its, is far more deeply involved now in the housing industry than it was during the boom. These are tremendous consequences, plus the enormous deficits. You know, we're going to have trillion dollar a year deficits uh, at least for several years on top of a very large public debt. I think when you put the political consequences and the fiscal consequences together, you're dealing with something that's really big, I mean, not as big as the Great Depression, but really big compared to anything we've had since uh, since the 30s. Okay, our, our boss Richard is telling us that, that we must end this despite it being We must end conditional upon one thing. Um, I started with thanks to Marjorie Holm of this law school and Sarah O of George Mason Law School. All of you have benefited from the administrations, understand just how important their contribution has been. So I would like to thank them. I would also... I would also like to thank all of the participants and all of the panels um, for what I thought was really a wonderful and stimulating session. And I'm glad we ended on such a happy note with respect to the future of America. But at least those of you who need to make your planes, please be on your way. And I know you're a regional airline expert who could get you there safely. Thank you all. Richard, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.